Good morning and welcome to the house of the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today we continue in our summer series on the priests of the Bible, looking at John chapters 11 and 18, and the people of Caiaphas and Annas. We'll make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's lift our voices to sing our opening song, God of Wonders. John 17, Jesus prays, The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. Heavenly Father, how we praise your holy name for your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all people. For you have redeemed us by your blood and made us one with Christ Jesus our Lord. May we shine forth his glory in our lives to your praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture text for today is from the Gospel of John, chapters 11 and 18. A couple of notes about the reading before we get into it. When we read the Jews, we're specifically thinking about the Jewish leaders, the council, not the common people. The Passover celebration was an annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem by many Jews. It means that the city was full and bustling at this time. 
And then the priests were all related in some way, being from the tribe of Levi originally, so it's not really too weird that Annas and Caiaphas are both involved here as father and son. From John chapter 11. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. Nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. And then John 18, 12 to 14. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. The Gospel of our Lord. Dear people of God, the sermon comes to you uh, with some credit to Reverend Charles Seat, uh, gleaned a lot of ideas and concepts from another sermon that he had written. In my lifetime, the most memorable act of terrorism, and I realize that this is memorable to me, I was living uh, where I was living at the time, I just remembered the, the, the events surrounding it, so maybe that's there's other ones for you, but uh, the most memorable act of terrorism was the attack on the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in 2001. The attack took nearly 3,000 lives, and over the last 20 years, coming up on 20 years here, we've seen many more die from bomb attacks and terrorist incidents all over the world. Many were innocent civilians. Many of those who bring terror have been radicalized into thinking that they are killing for a worthy cause. Some believe they're doing it out of righteous anger, justifying their own actions by what others have done first, maybe even directly to them. Others regard killing the innocent as a necessary evil to bring an end to an even greater evil. I wasn't going to go this direction at first, but after rereading what I had already written, I can't help but think of the innocent lives lost in abortion clinics. That, too, is gross injustice, sometimes done as a necessary evil. It tells us that we're not really that different in our society as the people we label as terrorists to our way of life. But whatever devices or ways we use to justify any of these acts of killing, we must understand one thing, that the heart of the problem is a problem of the heart. The human heart, which according to the scriptures is, uh, scripture passage Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says that it is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Ever since the fall took place in the Garden of Eden, the heart of every man, woman, and child has been deep, deeply infected with and is prone to commit sin. And here is the most sobering thought. Given just the right conditions, every one of us here can do and probably have done some pretty terrible things. At the time of our text from John 11, Jesus was about two months out from going to the cross at Calvary. That means traveling specifically to Jerusalem for the time of the Passover. He had been going about the ministries of healing, uh, teaching, protecting, restoring, and feeding. Oh, and he had just visited his friends Mary and Martha and raised their brother Lazarus back from the dead. 
If Jesus' regular ministry was miraculous, like the feeding of the 5,000, for example, and it was miraculous indeed, well, then this raising of Lazarus back from the dead was the miracle of miracles, calling out with the authority of heaven, Lazarus, come out! That's as godly of a voice as I can do, by the way. So. But as the man came out of the tomb and was reunited with his sisters, you can imagine the joy, laughter, and tears they all shared. What seemed impossible, what seemed like it might be a future possibility, but not on earth. So what otherwise seemed impossible was accomplished by the spoken words from Jesus' mouth. If there is any miracle that shouldn't have convinced the Jews, the Jewish leadership in particular, beyond any doubt at all that Jesus really is the Lord God in the flesh, like the miracle worker, the one who has power with his word, it would be this. Jesus had already done tons of other miracles, but this would be the masterpiece, the ultimate sign of who he was and what he was about, bringing life out of death. Shouldn't they now put all their doubts away and, full, and, embrace, and believe in him and embrace him fully as their Messiah and follow him wholeheartedly as their rabbi? They certainly should. I mean, it makes sense. What else could they do with all the evidence that was just right in front of them? But instead of doing any of this, the miracle of raising Lazarus evoked the worst reaction from the Jews. It became the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. It hardened their resolve to go all out to destroy Jesus. If you remember, the text uh, very specifically said, so from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. They went all out. This was what seems like their singular focus, to deal with this problem. They set out to destroy Jesus, and this set in, set in motion a chain of events that would eventually lead to his arrest, his trial, his crucifixion, and death, leaving us wondering why or how such a thing could even happen. Then we come back to the, the problem of the heart. If it were not for the grace of God, we might have done the same thing. Despite all the things, all the evidence that we have. We're talking about this because this is where the Jewish ruling council with people like Caiaphas and Annas landed. They decided for their reasons that Jesus had to die. In John 11, we can see their justification for it. In verses 45, and 40, 45 through 47, it just says uh, that they, were, uh, they saw what Jesus had been doing and they wanted to stop him from doing what he was doing. So that's one thing. So one way to stop him would be to kill him. Verse 48 starts off, If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. Apparently that's a problem. Believing in him as opposed to maybe their ways or following them. And then the kicker in the second half of verse 48. Uh, it says, the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Jesus was stealing their thunder. And I know that sounds trivial, it sounds grade schoolish or something like that, but that's kind of what was going on. And they really just wanted to take their toys and go home. He was, Jesus was doing miracles of healing and feeding and raising from the dead, giving the people real signs in their day, while the priests could only talk about what God had done in the past and pray that he would take action in the, in the future. They lacked the immediate action of God in their lives and, become, and became jealous of Jesus that he could simply deliver the goods. Add to that their selfish concern that the Romans would take away their place as leaders or rulers of the Jews, and you can see how they decided Jesus had to die. In a twist of their fate, as Jesus is sentenced to crucifixion by the Romans, 
the governor, Pontius Pilate, included in this, an inscription that the known world could read. It was in different languages, so they could, all could read it, and it declared Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Their best efforts, the Jewish ruling council's best efforts to keep Jesus from taking their place went for nothing. The priests of Jesus' day certainly had a different focus than the priests of Aaron's day, it seems. They shifted from mediating God's power to, to claiming some of that power and authority for their own. Instead of leading people into a relationship with God, they really wanted, just wanted to relate to people as their superiors. But our text also gives us a glimpse of what was going on in the spiritual realm. Uh, verse 51, right after Caiaphas' reasoning that Jesus should die, John writes, He did not say this of his own accord. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Ultimately, Jesus would die because it was God's plan. He would be called the Lamb of God because his life was given up for the sake of the many. He would be the perfect sacrifice because he had no blemish or spot. He would be the scapegoat as he carried the sins of the world to his death. And he would be the fulfillment of the law required by, giving, by being given over to death by the priests of Israel. Without even knowing it, Caiaphas had made an important prophetic pronouncement and by doing so, tied himself directly to the death of Jesus, stating that one man should die for the people. This doesn't make him a saint, obviously, but it does demonstrate that God is able to overturn the selfish ways of men like Caiaphas and subdue them into fulfilling his eternal plan. I think it can be overwhelming in our world today to have leaders we don't or can't trust. I have a difficult time with that one, I'll admit it. That's why, as the church assumes the role of mediating the relationship between God and the world, like the priests of old did, or were, to, or were supposed to be, we have a big responsibility to lead with godly integrity. When the world looks at the church, what does it see? Perfect and powerful people? Does the world see us as a special group who are richly rewarded for our efforts? Or does the world see forgiven sinners called forth each day from the grave of our own beds to shed our linens or satins or fleeces and proclaim the glorious works of God? God's plan isn't like human plans. It doesn't scheme for himself as humans do. He makes it his mission to save sinners, to redeem hearts that have been lost or broken. This is the way, for he is the truth who brings us life. In the name and the spirit of Jesus, amen. We profess our faith through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In our prayers this morning, we will include Charlie Doms, who is in hospice care at this time, uh, Jim Hinnenthal, who has returned home and is recovering from his medical procedures. Uh, we pray for those who are struggling with the effects of COVID and other diseases. And also we pray for uh, the, the people and situation in Canada, uh, the state of emergencies due to wildfires.
We pray. Great are you, O Lord, and greatly to be praised. You rule earth and sea and sky. We give you thanks for the blessings of creation and life that come from your abundant goodness. Give to your church boldness to speak of your awesome deeds and sing always of your righteousness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of might, spare us and future generations from wickedness. Give blessing to our nation and its leaders to rule according to your good pleasure. Protect the members of our armed forces, police, and other public servants. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, through your Son and his reconciling death, we receive all good gifts, healing, and sustenance. We bring before you the sick and those in need, especially Charlie Doms and Jim Hinenthal, those who are struggling with the effects of COVID or other diseases at this time, Lord, and also those who are caught in a state of emergency in Canada. Lord, we pray for your hand of, of healing and protection and encourage them in the midst of this life by the recognition of your fatherly providence known in Christ our Savior. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive now the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Our reading for next week, August 1st, is from the book of Acts, chapter 23. We're looking at the priest Ananias from mid-century, mid-first century uh, A.D. Coming up this week, we have a human trafficking presentation uh, by Wendy Proctor. That's Hildy Grady's uh, niece. This is uh, on Wednesday, July 28th at 6.30. I'm not sure if it'll be in the sanctuary or in the oasis, but if you do show up for that, just look for some signs or some guidance to find out where to go. It'll depend on the size of, of the response. On July 30th, so Friday of this week, there is an art and soul workshop. If you're interested in this, sign up needs to happen by Wednesday, July 28th. The cost is $10. The art and soul workshop is on Friday. It runs from 3.30 until 5 o'clock, led by Nicole Herbst. On Sunday, August 8th, is the Cajun Meal Fundraiser for our youth, and this is red beans and rice, along with sausage and corn on the cob. It's going to be super tasty, uh, 12 bucks per meal, and there are ways for you to buy those meals and, uh, how do I say, have them delivered? I guess, to other people, kind of as a gift or a surprise or something along those lines. So keep that in mind if you are watching this or hearing this uh, from out of state or out of town. And then finally, uh, August 15th is softball game with First Baptist. We've done this a few times already, but we're going to try it again this year and enjoy some friendly uh, rivalry in a way, just playing some softball and enjoying an afternoon on August 15th. Uh, the game will be at 4.30, warm-ups at 4 o'clock, and we're going to do a little bit of food be, uh, in, during the game, also some entertainment for families, so that if you've got a family and you just want to come on out, this could be a fun time for you to watch the game, have some fun in between innings, uh, enjoy some food, and also this is the, the main part. We're calling it the cleanup hitters. So when we're done, we'll be cleaning up the park, not just our own mess, but maybe doing a little bit extra to uh, tidy up the west side field. So as we close out our time together, we sing our closing song, Our God. Of the blind, no 
There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger Our God is greater, our God is stronger.